Hey, we're finishing up our sermon series, um, Losing Your Religion, and that's the challenge in addition to what you might hear in the workplace. Uh, I picked this, this sermon series on purpose because um, uh, we live in a world in the Northeast where, boy, there's a lot of different religions, aren't there? And we get, we get hit with this all over. Maybe, you know, a lot of us here believe Jesus, but when you're out there, the big complaint, the big thing out there is, well, Christians are so narrow-minded, right? You've probably heard that before. Christians think they're right about everything and that we're wrong about everything. And we've talked about that last week and some of the similarities. And the reason those similarities are there is because God has taken the time to write his law in our hearts. That's why when you get older, nobody has to tell you not to lie. We all know lying is wrong. You know, we, nobody has to tell you to steal because God has taken his time to write our law in our hearts. And the devil really can't get around that. So most of the religions out there have a set of a commandments, right? And, and we have these in common. Uh, they're in Judaism, they're in Christianity, because we affirm the Old Testament, you know, that's in fact, Jesus came to fulfill the Old Testament. But if you go to Buddhism, you go into, you know, uh, Islam, they have these same things, and we have these in common. But the other thing that we have in common with all of those other religions on the planet is failure, right? Because we can't keep these, and they can't keep these. And and so their religion then gives them a list of things to do to hopefully, hopefully get right with God. There's no promises in those other religions because they don't know for sure, but they hope they have a good list. And, 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 and so failure is the other thing because nobody keeps these, right? I mean, if you had a brother or a sister, you weren't always nice to her. And that's one of the commandments, right? Be kind to siblings. Yeah, right. But there was a time, right? I mean, I had four brothers uh, that you weren't so kind to your sibling. Yeah, no padding there. I saw that. I'm just kidding. She's, she, so, so anyway, um, so, so the, the, the other thing we have in common is failure, right? I mean, and, and, and we can take Christianity and kind of lump that in because about, oh, 20 minutes after Jesus ascended into heaven, they had this big argument. You know, what do these Gentiles have to do? to be? They have to become Jews before, and they have to keep the law in order to be Jesus followers, right? And so it wasn't long before that argument began, and then a couple hundred years later, you know, we started having, you know, all the sacraments and all the obligations in church, you know, and we started to make Christianity look a lot like, wow, all these other things. It wasn't a whole lot different, and so if you're not careful... Boy, it can even, if you're, you know, not into all of that, even in, you know, you believe Jesus, you believe he died, and it was only by faith, but, wow, you, we can get legalistic and judgmental even in our own hearts, can't we? Because we can, we, we like to go back to the religion, don't we, you know? And you get judgmental, you see somebody not in church, you know, they take too many vacations, or, you know, whatever, I'm not saying you guys do that at all. And so, you know, basically failure comes into life, failure because you can't keep the rules regardless of what religion you're in. And so basically all the religions on the planet, we talked about this last week, there is a God, God has a standard for you, but it's way too hard. So you're all going to be failures at this. And so good luck, you know, good luck. Um, here's a list of things to do to try to get back on God's side. And uh, by the way, um, we we'll hope to see you on the other side, maybe. I hope to see you on the other side. Hopefully, by the way, don't forget to buy my book on the way out. Don't forget to get the shirt on the way out. Don't forget. And, and by the way, leave your offering at the door. You know, all the religions, you know, they kind of say the, basically the same thing. Never quit, right? And then, then they say, you know, we have this list of failures and that's where the gaps start to occur. What do you do with that? What do you do with the failures? What do you do with the mistakes? <laughs> Wait, well, it was a whole conversation a week or two ago. What do you do with the, with, with, with the, the sins if you want to get into Christianity? You know, what do you want to do with those, those things that we do when we mess up? We didn't even talk about Scientology. That's another one I forgot to throw in there. What do you forget to do? They call it forgetfulness. I mean, how awesome is that? I'm just telling you. 
That's like so cool. I just, we just forgot. But I, I, I have a problem with that because I didn't always forget to do the right thing. Sometimes I knew what I should do and I did the wrong thing. In fact, sometimes in my life, and I'll just get real honest with you because I know you wouldn't be this devious, but I went, I, I know what I should do, but let me think about how I'm going to do the wrong thing. And then I did certain steps and, and then I did the wrong thing. I didn't forget. I went right into you. Don't, uh, me, you know, so, you know, you did that too. Come on. So, but I love that whole forgetful. We were just forgetful, you know, yeah. Yeah, I don't know how that works out. But anyway, religion reminds us that there's something, something, something amiss, something wrong. So there's a gap. There's rules of all these religions. They condemn us. And all the religions on the planet, they're just powerless, literally powerless to take you any further than that. That's what the, we've learned. And then... And then there's Jesus. And then there's Jesus. We've been talking about that for now three weeks. And we settled on this verse last week for what the law was powerless to do because the power, law can only go guilty, guilty, can innocent or guilty. And if you're guilty, it can just point the finger. It can't fix you, right? There's the law and you broke it. And that's as the best as it can do. So that what the law was powerless to do, the law was powerless to fix you. What the law was powerless to do, and we had you mark and underline this verse, God did, right? Romans 8, 3. We love that verse. That's the memory verse last week and this week. What the law was powerless to do, God, because he has infinite power, he has instant, infinite wisdom, he was able to figure it out. He was able to do it. What the law was powerless to do, God did by sending his own son to be a sin offering. The law couldn't do it. Religion couldn't accomplish it. You broke it. You're guilty. The penalty is death. And Jesus came and gave his own life up as a sin offering for you and for me. For Mother Teresa, as wonderful as she was, she had some sin out there for Mary, the mother of Jesus, how blessed she was. I mean, can you imagine God choosing you to be that close to the Messiah, to Jesus, to God incarnate? And yet she said, I need a savior. In her magnificent, she said, God, my savior. Even the blessed mother of Jesus had sin as wonderful and as incredibly blessed as she was. She blew it. She had a failure and still Still God, in his infinite wisdom, sent his son through Mary to be a sin offering, to pay the sin penalty for Mary, for you, for your mama, for your grandma, for all the people on the planet, because we've all blown it. That's what we have in common. But here's the, the challenge. Here's the, I know most of you believe that, and we're so glad that you're here, but there might be somebody here that doesn't. I'm going to speak to them today. But I want to also tell you that you probably know somebody in the cubicle next to you that thinks this, that, that has a problem with this. And here's what they're thinking. Here's what maybe you've thought in the past. Here's what somebody that maybe a relative of yours is thinking. But Jesus' claims are exclusive. But the problem is, Mr. Christian, Miss Christian, Jesus' claims are unique. Yes, that's true, right? Jesus' claims are unique. We, we get that. Jesus' claims are too narrow. That's the problem, right? That's problematic for so many people on the planet. When you say it's this way, when you point to a cross or you point somebody to Jesus, you say, it's this way that is also saying at the very same time, and you don't even have to say it, if it's this way, then it's not that way. Whatever religion you might be a part of, whatever meditation or new age or whatever, if that's the way, then that's not the way. And that's the problem with so many people, right? That's the problem with so many people. This is narrow. This is unique. This is, this is exclusive. How can you be so narrow-minded? And then they say, well, that's unfair. And then they say, maybe not in this many words, but they, they basically get to that's unfair. It's uncomfortable. 
It's unfair and it's uncomfortable. And since it's unfair and since it's uncomfortable, it must be untrue, period, right? It must be untrue because it's uncomfortable and it's unfair. Therefore, it must be, uncom- it must be untrue. Or is it untrue? Is it untrue? To say you can't learn your way to heaven, to say that you can't earn your way to heaven, just take the L off the learn, to to say you can't meditate your way into heaven is offensive. It's it's harsh. It's it's exclusive. It's narrow. It's unique. It's all of that. And and I'll, I'll give that to you. I'll give that to that person. That's true. So I want to respond to that particular resistance today on purpose. I want to take a whole Sunday. If you're a believer, we're so glad you're here. This may help you and hopefully this will equip you to kind of answer that objection, that question, those thoughts, because you're going to get them. We live in the Northeast. You may not get it so much in the Bible Belt. When I lived down there, I had never even met some of the people that we talk to up here. It's kind of kind of interesting to meet some of them, especially if you take a cab in the in Manhattan, you know, you're going to meet all, sorry, you're going to meet all kinds of people, right? Lucy, you might want to back up today. I'm just kidding. <laughs> just kidding. So here's why we want to talk about this uncomfortable, unfair, untrue way of thinking, because it keeps most people, many people from focusing on another question. And that question is, the most important question. That question is, who is Jesus? This, this, this line of thinking keeps them so fixated. That's what the enemy wants, right? It keeps them so fixated on, is it, it's uncomfortable, it's, un, it, it's un, unfair, so it must be untrue. It keeps them focused on that and keeps them, their minds off of thinking, who is Jesus? Uncomfortable and unfair is not an argument against anything. Uh, Uncomfortable and unfair is not an argument for untrue. That's true, isn't it? (laughs) If you really get down to it, it's not true. It's not, it's not there. So uncomfortable and unfair, something may be that, but it can be true at the very same time. And most of the time it is true. I'll give you a couple of examples. Um, um, in, in Rotary, we, we, you've heard this before, we've helped this village get uh, clean water. Their, their people, their little children in kindergarten already had hypertension, had high blood pressure. As a result, the, the age of death in that village was so low. It was crazy low. I forget what it was now, but it was like 30s, 40s. People were dropping dead because high blood pressure ruined your life very quickly. And so these doctors went down there and they had to go through Port-au-Prince. You have to fly into Port-au-Prince and then you have to take an entire day to travel by a boat, by plane to get to this little village because it's in the middle of nowhere. Our church, you might not know this, but our church has bought curriculum for this Christian school that's there. And, you know, that's something we've done over a couple of years in a row. We've bought curriculum that they use and use and reuse there because they don't have anything. It's really a a very poor town. But when you go through Port-au-Prince, and I confess I've never been there, I just hear the stories, hundreds of children are born infected with AIDS and they die by the time they're two years old. That's like a national thing that's happening in Port-au-Prince. Is that uncomfortable to talk about? It is for me to even talk to you about it. Is it unfair that's unfair. I, I would give you that. But is it untrue? No, it's very true. It's a, it's a very harsh reality that's actually taking place. Um, in China, um, David Platt, the youngest megachurch pastor in Birmingham, Alabama, ever, you know, he's like this young guy, but he's so anointed by the Holy Spirit. He's an incredible speaker. He's kind of odd to listen to for the first few minutes, but after that, it just... It's just the Holy Spirit shows up. Every, every sermon I've ever heard him preach. And, and he goes to China because you can't openly proclaim the gospel in China. You get arrested, right? So he flies over there secretly. I mean, he flies over there. And then 
he meets in underground churches and, and he hears all of the things, but he preaches for days and people travel, pastors travel all over to hear what they can't get anywhere else. And so they, they stay and he, he talks. But one of the things he's talked about and other pastors have talked about is that there are orphanages over there. And these orphanages have a lot of crippled children because you can only have one child in China or you get huge fines and penalties so families can only have one child. And if the child is crippled, man, they just kind of turn it out. And if it's a girl, this orphanage has a huge abundance of girls because you want a healthy boy in China to help you with the farm or whatever you've got going on. And, and so there's, there's a huge number and crippled children in, in this particular orphanage that I've heard about. Is that unfair? You bet it's unfair, isn't it? That's crazy. Is that uncomfortable to talk about? Without question, isn't it? But is it untrue? See, I can think of far more things that are unfair uncomfortable and true than I can think of that are true, fair, and comfortable. Far more. And so can you. If you really got honest with yourself and thought about this and probably haven't thought about this, this just isn't true, right? I mean, this is uncomfortable, unfair is usually true. That's the problem, right? So we just eliminated this argument. We haven't proved Christianity by disproving this argument, but we have removed this argument from the repertoire of maybe who you're talking about. If you, you know, talk to them and have a long enough conversation, you could probably remove that argument with that. But, but many people think that if there is a perfect God there would be a system that is absolutely fair. If there's a perfect God, there would not only be a system that's absolutely fair, but by definition, it would be absolutely comfortable as far as they would be concerned, right? As far as their standard would be, they would be comfortable enough to believe it. And that's what they're hoping for. That's what they're looking for, but the reason we are looking for that solution, this may surprise you, but if you get far enough down the line in conversation with somebody, the reason that they're having this thought process is because we severely underestimate the significance of our sin and the brokenness of our world. We severely, it says the, the, the Proverbs, the wisest man ever lives said, Every man proclaims his own righteousness. We, we don't like to think of ourselves as sinners, so we minimize what we've done. And of course, what everybody else does is much worse. But when we start to compare ourselves with others, when we think of our sin, we compare ourselves with not Mother Teresa because that would make us look too bad, right? But we compare ourselves with the person next to us at work or that guy that embezzled money, right? I mean, you know how bad he is. And they caught that other guy looking at porn on the company computer or whatever. I'm not that stupid, right? And, 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 or, they, or, you know, that guy that, you know, and we think of all of these people and we start to compare ourselves with those people. And we look really, really, really good in comparison to Adolf Hitler and Mussolini and Joseph Stalin and all of these people. And that's where we compare ourselves. So we minimize our sin and we don't like to think of the brokenness. I mean, when's the last time you thought of those little orphan people in Haiti? When's the last time you thought about the orphanage in China, right? I mean, we don't, we just, I'm not, I'm not trying to make you feel bad about that. I'm just saying that's what we do. We severely underestimate the significance of our own sin and the brokenness of our world. We we do that. Even we do that. I mean, that's like what everybody does. And, and we know that everybody falls short of this list, right? I mean, we know there's commandments out there. We know the difference between right and wrong. And so does the person you know you're talking to or maybe comes up with some of this stuff. They know that everybody falls short of the standards. They, they get that. They've seen that. They believe that. They, they know that they haven't been nice to their siblings. They, they know that they've lied. They, they, haven't, they know that they should put others first and, and they don't. They, they get that. So we really 
but we really don't think we're all that bad. We, we do this comparison. We say we aren't perfect. I mean, you've probably said that yourself. You've probably heard other people say, you know, yeah, I, I've done these things, but I'm not, I'm not perfect. Nobody's perfect, right? There we go, lumping us all in together. We're not perfect. So we believe with us, we're just like a half step down from perfect. We're like maybe two steps down from perfect. And there's a lot of people worse off than we are on the scale. But the problem is we're not judged. In fact, in fact, we're, we don't even call our sin, sin, do we? We don't, we don't, even we, I mean, get real honest, I don't even like the word sin. I prefer mistakes. We have had that conversation, right? Affairs, stealing, cheating, mistakes. The press conference, right, we talked about. I've, I've, I've you know, I made a 25-year mistake, and we're just something short with that word. Then we read about this unimaginable crime, you know, one that really keeps me up at night. I'm going, how can we do more with that? And we've, you know, through different ministries, we've done SOAP project to help these young girls that are in sex trafficking, you know, and and we've done certain things and helped with certain things. Even, even part of, of the money from the church goes to these things that, you know, this one thing keeps me up at night, these girls that get in, in the sex trafficking. And the city I was in is one of the worst cities in the country, Nashville. New York City is one of the, another really bad city of sex trafficking uh, in the United States. You don't have to go across the seas to to find that that's horrific. And we hear about these unimaginable crimes and these incredible things that are taking place in our country and around the world. And, and you go, what was that about? What was, what was up with that? You know, we turn the news on and we see these chemical attacks. This leader, you know, just the last week or so, who would ever use chemicals on children and their they're like washing them off and you see them taking medicine, you know, but their lungs are probably permanently scarred from that chlorine. They're probably going to die an early death as a result of what happened. And, you know, who knows what happened? I'm not, I wasn't there, but you're like, what is up with us? What is up with our, 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 our world? And, and that is... Just an extension, and if you really think about it, just the extension of the selfishness that exists in all of us. I, I read this somewhere or heard it somewhere in a sermon. I don't know where I got it, but my children have heard it a thousand times. But there, but by the grace of God, go I. We're like any other family, and we get a little judgmental at times. We probably get a whole lot judgmental at times. I mean, we sit around the dinner table, you know, and talk about stuff, and and, 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 you know, Maria's shaking her head because she's like the most unjudgmental person. I go, okay, guys, we can't keep going here. But there, but by the grace of God, go I. This could be me, you know, if God hadn't shined his light in his favor and helped me in my life. So we can't, you know, we should, we should try to help that homeless guy or whatever, you know. And so that's where that goes. But everybody's guilty, right? We go back to these eight commandments. What if... What if there is a list of right and wrongs? What if, what if this list is the standard that God has taken the time to write on the heart of all of humanity everywhere? What if, just what if, you can use this with your friend that's questioning all of this and you're having the conversation. What if breaking one of these commandments in, in his religion, her religion, what if there is condemnation for the people who break? What if when you tell a lie or have sex or lust or whatever, what if the penalty really is death? What if there is a serious penalty for com committing one of these atrocities? What if, what if you are guilty before a holy God, what if that is true? Then do you really want God to be fair with you? <laughs> do you really want God to give you what you deserve? Is that really what you want? God to be 
fair? We took the fair slide down, but do you really want God to be fair? You see, we don't want fair. Your friend doesn't want fair. Your kids don't want fair. They want mercy, don't they? Your friends don't want fair. The guy in the cubicle next to you doesn't want fair. You want forgiveness. That's what we want. We don't want fair. There is no comfortable way, no more comfortable way to address sin than dealing with cancer. Cancer, sometimes you have to have incredibly obtrusive procedures and really uncomfortable procedures to deal with it. So when you go to the doctor, the first question you ask, if I've counseled and prayed with many cancer survivors and people that didn't survive cancer, but their first question wasn't, doctor, how comfortable is this procedure going to be? That They may get to that, but it's after how effective is this procedure going to be? Isn't it? That usually the first question? Well, this, this procedure, Mr. Cancer Guy, is 99% effective. I'm really confident it's going to help you. What are the side effects? Oh, it's going to be way bad, right? Sign me up because it's going to help, right? Your first question is how effective it is, not how comfortable it is so that really shouldn't play into this whole equation, but it still does, doesn't it? But here's the incredible news. Jesus came and introduced the fairest, the most comfortable approach that was possible in a completely unfair and uncomfortable world. That's what Jesus came and did. I mean, is it fair and comfortable? No, but it is the most fair and the most comfortable thing that he could possibly do. The truth is, the truth is, God went way beyond fair when dealing with our sin. I mean, like way above and beyond what anybody would consider fair and even reasonable or comfortable. In Romans chapter 5, verse 6 through 8, which is where we're going to talk about today, it says, you see, at just the right time, there wasn't a better time that Jesus could have come in history, at just the right time when we were still powerless. This is chapter 5. Paul made that even clearer in chapter 8, which we talked about last week, but powerless over All the law, we couldn't keep what the law was powerless to do. We were still powerless. We were still religious. We still didn't have the right answer. At just the right time when we were still powerless in every single way imaginable, Christ died for the ungodly. And he continues to unpack this through the next verses. He says, very rarely will anyone die for a righteous man. That is so true. Though for a good man, someone might possibly dare to die. That's true too. Might possibly, not usually, but sometimes that happens. But God, here's another one. You can mark that in your Bible. You should get your Bibles out and highlight all the but gods in your Bible because that's just such a powerful two words. What, What we were powerless to do, but God showed up, right? And then you know there's a miracle on the horizon. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still, what's this word? Not mistakers, not forgetful. (laughs) While we were still sinners. That means doing all of this on purpose. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. While we were still sinners, when we were still headlong in all of this junk over here, right? It's in the throwaway box, losing our religion. While we were still all involved in all of this stuff, trying to earn our way back, sinning on purpose, disobeying all the God law, whether we knew God or not, he wrote it on our hearts and we knew we shouldn't do it. We were still planning and plotting and doing it on purpose. Anyway, while we were still doing that, God showed up and paid the death penalty for our sin. 
Is that fair? No. Yeah. Is, that's grace. That's what that's called. Is that, is that fair? No. But that's mercy. Is that fair? Are you kidding me? There's nothing fair about this. Jesus certainly got the short end of this stake, didn't he? Yeah. But that's incredible. That's amazing. Fair? Are you kidding me? But absolutely amazing. That would be a word for that. Fair wouldn't be one. Christianity offers the most just system possible in an unjust world. You see, everybody, everybody is welcome. That's where the grace comes in. Grace just means gift, free gift. You, you can't earn it. You don't deserve it. Everybody is welcome. Everybody. David Berkowitz, the 44 caliber kill, killer, he, he, he got it. <laughs> now, you may not have even known that, but he's winning more people to Jesus with his prison ministry than, than many of us combined. It's unbelievable what God is doing through that guy, the Apostle Paul, the chiefest of sinners, he says. <laughs> he was holding coats for the first martyr of the Christian church, Stephen. Everybody is welcome. If there's still air in their lungs, <laughs> there's still a candidate. Everybody is welcome. That's grace. Everybody gets in the same way. <laughs> there's only one, Jesus. Everybody gets in the same way. It's not through... All of that stuff, it's only through Jesus. And everybody can meet the requirement. God made it so simple so that the least among us could believe and trust and have faith in Christ. Children, four, five, three years old can say, Jesus is my Lord and be saved doesn't take a college degree. Is it fair? No. Is it comfortable? No. Does it mean it's untrue? No, it doesn't. To this unfair, uncomfortable world, God sent his son to go way beyond fair, way beyond comfortable to offer us exactly what we never, ever deserved, grace, forgiveness, Mercy to all who would believe on the sacrifice that he did for you. Past, present, and future, just as we sing about. <laughs> everybody is welcome. Absolutely everybody, including the guy in the cubicle next to you. Isn't that awesome? The issue I hope you will wrestle to the ground is not... Is it comfortable or fair? The issue, I hope you will help your friend because God brought him into your life on purpose is not is it comfortable or fair, but is it true? And if it's true, what are you going to do with it? If it's true, what are you going to help them do with it? <laughs> if it's true, I hope you will believe it. I hope you will help them believe it. It'll make all the difference in their world. Father, we love you today. We praise you. We thank you for Jesus, as uncomfortable as it might be, as unfair as it might seem, as true as it is. God, I pray in the name of your son, Jesus, that you would grant the gift of faith to everybody who hears this in person. And Lord, I know there are people watching online. We hear about it a lot. And God, I pray that you would give the gift of faith to everyone who watches online. I pray that you would help them see that it's not religion that's going to save them, that it is Jesus Christ alone. God created a way, and it was the perfect way, and he didn't come up with a whole bunch of alternatives in case that was too uncomfortable or seemed too unfair for someone because the sacrifice for sin had to be holy blood, God's blood. That was the only thing that could satisfy the justice of God. So he took the penalty upon himself. We broke the law. 
and he paid the death penalty. Is it fair? No. It cost you everything. It cost you your only begotten son. But it's true. And it's true because you loved us so much. So grant the gift of faith. Equip the saints that are hearing this that already believe it to go out into a skeptical world, a world that believes it's unfair, it believes it's uncomfortable, therefore it must be untrue. Equip us to deal with and handle those arguments so that, Lord, we can win a whole bunch of people to Jesus. Lord, we praise you for this series, and we praise you for what you're doing in our life. In Jesus' name, amen.